Hey everyone, it's Michael Zapersky, and today I'm here with Steve Glaveski. Steve, welcome. Thank you so much, Mike. Oh, what's that? No, thank you so much, Michael. Oh, let's try it again. I think the, the audio cut out there, so let's, let's restart that. <laughs> all right, everyone, this is going to be uh, all good. So, uh, hey everyone, it's Michael Zapersky, and today I'm here with Steve Glaveski. Steve, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. So Steve, you're the CEO of Collective Campus, uh, one of Australia's fastest growing new consulting and training companies, and you help large organizations unlock their people's potential to innovate and thrive. Tell us, what does that mean? <laughs> what does that mean? Well, your typical large organization, Michael, uh, has ways of operating that perhaps lended themselves to success in the 20th century, but not so much today. So what are those ways? Well, those ways are typically characterized by meetings to prepare for meetings, a lot of outsourcing of accountability. And that sort of stuff made sense when the world was changing slowly and you had an existing business model to deliver on. Here's the process. Let's just deliver on that. But when the pace of change outside your walls is faster than the pace of change inside your walls, inevitably you will be left behind. So what we do is we go into large organizations, whether they're large telecommunications companies, whether they're large law firms, you name it. And we work with them firstly on culture. So understanding what their current processes, systems, values, and uh, resources look like and will those resources systems values and so on actually support them uh, on their ongoing journey their growth journey uh, we look at capability building so for example are we talking about say product development if so how do they go about doing that well we use waterfall we've been using that for decades okay that may have made sense when you were taking tried and true products to market but you're trying to do new things now that are uh, underpinned by a lot of untested assumptions. Well, we need to be using, you know, agile. We need to be using lean startup to really test those assumptions thick and fast and not waste our time and money. Um, and then the third piece is around collaboration. So oftentimes changing internally is more of a marathon than a sprint. So what we like to do is identify uh, problems and or opportunity areas that our clients want to tackle. And then we'll run like a global campaign to find startups and scale ups that are already working in that space, have products in that space that can essentially solve a real problem with a, with a real solution and mm -hmm. help these clients actually tap into what we call, you know, quote unquote disruptive innovation today, rather than two or three years down the track. Makes sense. And then if we go further back, like your background, you worked with uh, Dun and Bradstreet, right? Ernst and Young, uh, Macquarie Group, KPMG, what kind of propelled you to leave the corporate world and actually start building your own businesses? Yeah, you know, like most things in life, it's very rarely just a linear uh, equation. Uh, yeah. uh, I mean, I spent almost 10 years in the corporate world and, you know, sometimes that was rewarding and oftentimes I did find myself in those meetings to prepare for meetings and I felt like I had a lot more to contribute. So at one point I got a little bit fed up and I observed that there was a lot of vacant office space at all of my client sites. And I came up with this idea for hot desk, which is essentially a startup I built about eight years ago. Uh, it was an Airbnb for office space. Um, and I managed to successfully raise about $150,000 while I was still working full time at Macquarie bank. And that was on the back of a $2,000 prototype and a press release that I sent to about a hundred journalists, 99 of which ignored me, ignored me, but one of them published this article happened to be one of the biggest publishers in Australia, the, the Australian newspaper that got the interest of investors. And then that check basically bought me a couple of years uh, to go out on my own and explore entrepreneurship. And um, while I built that business up on the supply side, the demand side wasn't really there. Um, but at the same time, after two years of working in that space, I just immersed myself totally in everything entrepreneurship, um, mm. prototyping, customer acquisition, like you name it. Um, and at the end of that journey, I realized that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I wanted to do my own thing, but I didn't want to be what I thought was a glorified real estate agent. Um, and what I also learned on that journey was that all these things that I picked up, all these tools, techniques, and so on, were completely foreign to everything that I knew in the corporate world. But I knew that the corporate world, the companies that I worked for, needed to start embodying these principles. And so that's when I started testing the idea of bringing these back into the corporate world about you know, five, just over five years ago. And here we are today. So now your clients include organizations like uh, PNB Paribas, National Australia Bank, Microsoft, MetLife, Sportsbet, Australia Post, Deloitte, IBM, right? A whole bunch of others that people know, and I'm sure some that people maybe don't know. But what have you found has been kind of the most effective marketing strategy and approach for you all to actually go out and land those types of high caliber clients? 
Yeah. Yeah. Look again, I'd love to say it's a straight line from marketing to hooking that client. And oftentimes what we find is with many of these deals, it could be a six month uh, sales cycle in some cases up to 18 months. Um, mm. It's really, really, really one touch point. It's usually multiple touch points, which is why like yourself, you know, we have a podcast, we publish eBooks, we have a blog posts, we have the weekly um, email marketing that goes out posts on social media, like just doing all of that stuff because there might be 17 touch points before they believe in you enough to actually work with you. Um, but what you also want to do in, in any case is look for signals in the market. And that could be that someone has joined a role in an organization uh, as a, they're the new CTO and they're going to want to shake things up. Um, so they're incentivized to work with new organizations and bring talent into the organization, new ways of working. So reach out to them. Um, it could be that they've been mentioned in the media talking about say technology adoption and that's your, your space. You're all about digital transformation. Reach out to that person, say, Hey, saw you in this article. Um, that's going to be more effective than just cold emailing or calling hundreds of people who maybe don't have budget, appetite, timing, or need for what you're, what you're proposing. Um, and, and ultimately, uh, I think the third thing would be just around like turning objections into conditions. I mean, essentially just reframing that and saying, well, this is the objection. That's actually a condition of purchase. How can we provide them with whether that's the pricing, the service, the delivery mechanism, whatever it is. And the better you get at making friends with no and asking them, well, what would turn this five out of 10 likelihood of buying into a 10 out of 10, just asking those questions can give you so much wealth of knowledge. And it might not give you that particular prospect over the line, but you can take that knowledge with you forward with the next prospect. And over time, you come up with a much more rock solid offering. And are you currently the one who's doing like the majority of the sales or all of the sales in your organization? Or have you built out to have other salespeople? Kind of what does that look like right now for you? Yeah, so we've built that out. I mean, I still do a little bit of it. I probably spend about 15% of my time doing that because I believe that um, as the leader of the organization, I should still have my ear to the ground uh, in terms of that stuff. But at the same time, once you've developed a reasonably... Um, I wouldn't say bulletproof, that's a very strong word, but a reasonably good sales process, uh, you can then turn that into a process and get other people on board to actually go out and sell for you. Um, as a leader, you should be focused on strategy. You should be focused on facilitating outcomes in your team, removing any roadblocks and ensuring that you're focusing on growth rather than constantly being in the weeds of selling um, because then I'm working in my business and not on my business. Um, at the same time, it, it is important to maintain a little bit of a balance just so you know, if I'm going out there spending 15% of my time talking to prospects and I keep hearing things like, oh, we're working with this new company that's come on onto the scene or no, we don't need that kind of stuff anymore. We're good. What we're actually after is this and this is all new. Then suddenly I need to go back to the drawing board and think about these things. And at the same time, you should be encouraging your sales guys uh, to bring that knowledge to you, whether it's on a weekly or a monthly basis, some way to capture common objections, uh, learnings in the field. And that way you don't need to spend as much time uh, doing that yourself. And so how do you do that? Are you documenting or having your salespeople document that in a CRM? Um, is, are you sitting down on either like those daily or weekly meetings to kind of go over, hey, what objections did you encounter this week or today or yesterday or whatever? And like, what, what's been the best practice for you all to uh, to be able to kind of benefit from all that, uh, all the objections that you're receiving so you can strengthen and kind of improve for, uh, for going forward. Yeah. Yeah. I mean the CRM, we use copper. Um, so essentially like most CRMs, uh, once you drag a opportunity into one lost or abandoned, you capture a reason, right? And we make sure that those reasons are consistent, consistently labeled. Uh, so maybe there's about 15 of them. Um, if we need to create a new one, we will, but then we can export that on a monthly basis, group them and then say, okay, well, you know, 70% of the time we lost a, a deal was because the price point was just too high for them. Um, right. let's, let's talk about that. Um, and that way it just makes it more methodical for you. And I'd rather not have, you know, meetings every day or every week because that can just become routine. And once things become routine, they kind of lose their value. But when you do them once a month and you've got actual data to support those conversations, you're going in there with a plan about what you're going to talk about. It becomes constructive and people enjoy that. Whereas it is easy to fall into the trap of just having daily standups because that's what you do. And people just roll their eyes when it's like, Oh, let's have our standup guys. And 
that's yeah, it's not not a good place. Not your be. culture, not your culture over there um, in terms of yeah. what you guys. Do. I, I get that. Okay, that's cool. It's I think yeah, it's important to for everyone to recognize right. There's there's never only one way to do something. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it's it's nice to be able to see you can find how something is working really well for one organization or or you know one consultant and then see someone who's doing completely uh, something completely different, but it's working exceptionally well for them. Uh, so can you walk us through, Steve, just kind of from a high level, like what what is the sales process look like for you right now and for your company that's just kind of like the best. I mean, you, you mentioned that you've identified these signals, but just kind of take people through because you, you mentioned it could be months, in some cases, well over a year to actually land a client. So is, is a start off point, is it like finding a signal on LinkedIn and then connecting with that person? Is it picking up the phone and calling them? What has been the kind of the best practice that your sales team uses? Yeah, look, it's... Um if we find a signal, we will then uh, reach out to them usually on LinkedIn. Yep. Um, but we won't just say, Hey, saw you in the media. I would love to chat. We will provide them with some kind of value. So usually say if I find a, a technology executive from an insurance company was mentioned in the media, I'll reach out to them and say, Hey, saw you were talking about digital transformation at MetLife. Just so happens that we've worked with a few firms in that space. And here's an ebook we wrote on innovation in insurance check it out. It's a free download. Mm. That way we're, we're not even asking for a meeting. We're not, we're just providing them with value and it relates to what- are you sending that? Is that done there? Are you doing that through LinkedIn or actually just through email? Uh, that's usually through LinkedIn. Um, but sometimes we find that, and you probably find this yourself, people don't always check LinkedIn as much as employees don't check LinkedIn as much as entrepreneurs, I think is the thing. So mm. if you're not getting that response, if you don't see the read receipt, uh, then you, uh, you should, follow up with an email maybe five days later. And yeah. you know, nowadays emails are easy to find. You know, you've got tools like rocket reach and hunter.io and lead IQ to help you do that. Um, and then if that doesn't work, then you know, get, get on the phone, try and try and get through the switchboard and you've got all sorts of gatekeepers there, but it's worth giving that a shot because these people are busy. Um, and just because they haven't responded to your LinkedIn message or your email doesn't mean that they're not interested in what you've got to, um, to offer. How important is the phone for you? Because the phone is like one of these things that just so many people are, are scared of, right? It's, they, mm. They'd rather like, I don't know, you know just hop off a, a side of a building or something than, than pick up the phone. It's just, it freaks them out, right? And not, yeah. Hopefully not, not too tall of a building. But uh, <laughs> in, in your own experience, how, how actually effective has picking up the phone been? Uh, very effective. And look, I totally get people's innate sort of biological refrain from picking up the phone because it's kind of like you're being judged immediately and it's this whole going back to being ostracized from the tribe and you know it's about human survival in a way whereas email you don't really get that um but the big thing with the phone and i've seen this time and time again where i'll send an email uh you know we we might get a, a an inquiry from a prospect somewhere in the world and they'll say, Hey, we're interested in this. And I'll send an email with, well, this is what we can do for you. And here's the price point and blah, blah. And I won't hear anything for two or three days. And then you know, I'll pick up the phone and I'll actually have a conversation with them and I'll find out exactly what they need. What are the objections? Why didn't you get back to me? And I'll learn so much about that. And I'll say, Oh, well, why didn't you say so? Mm. Here's a fresh proposal. And that will get over the line. And having known that nowadays, I pick up the phone much earlier in the piece. So as soon as we, for example, if someone downloads an ebook on our website, they, in order to do that, they need to leave a phone number and an email address. That hits my email or one of the sales guys' emails. It automatically gets assigned to someone in the team based on which asset it was on our website. Mm-hmm. And their job is to then pick up the phone straight away. And yeah. if they don't answer on the first call, second call. More often than not, people pick up the phone on the second call, like, who is this? Uh, and, and that tends to work. And then it's really about asking questions to find out exactly what they're is this something they need now? Is it a qualified lead? Have they got budget? How much budget? Sometimes just asking how much budget have you got? If you let me know what your budget is, I can build something according to that rather than just playing this guessing game where you might over or underestimate how much they're willing to spend. Mm. Um, So, and you overestimate, you don't get the deal. You underestimate, you could have got maybe 50% more on that piece of piece of work. Right? So it's, it's crucial. And so, okay, so you've kind of captured that signal. You've then reached out to them. You've said, hey, get, grab the ebook. You make a follow-up phone call potentially or even an email to see if they have any questions about it to kind of move the conversation forward. Where do you go from there? Let's say that someone has provided their phone number. Uh, you know, you reach mm-hmm. out to them. They may or may not pick up the phone. What does the next step look like you know, in terms of your nurture? Do you have kind of a well-defined 
you send them other documents, other resources, you're sending yep. an email every week or two. What does that look like from a high level? Yeah, yeah. So depending on what they actually download on our website, they'll get, they'll up themselves into a drip feed. Um, okay. For example, if it was that innovation in insurance ebook, it could be like a five email drip feed that they'll get over say three or four weeks, which will include information, um, case studies, um, tools and techniques, frameworks. It's all there to basically build social proof and build us in their mind as some kind of an authority figure, like a thought leadership mm -hmm. figure. Um, but outside of that, we will then proactively also send them content that may not be in that drip feed that may relate to something we know of them. Oh, hey, just saw this um, list of the top 50 innovators in the insurance space in, in Asia, whatever, something random. But right. you might find it interesting. Check it out. And that way, we're just staying front of mind. Um, but it's important not to be too pushy. At the same time, you want to follow up and follow up and follow up. Uh, I had uh, Ryan Serhant on my show. He's a like a billion dollar real estate agent from New York. And he was saying how sometimes he'll follow up over a hundred times and then he'll get the deal. Um, and it's, it's, it just shows that it shows to that prospect that, Hey, you are loyal. You're, you're disciplined. You follow through rather than just looking for that quick win and then forgetting them and moving on to someone else. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, how many people are in your company today? So it's, it's a good question because we have cut our team size. We were about 10 and now we're five in the core team. And yeah. what we do is we're very big on an extended network of facilitators, contractors, consultants around the world of which we've got about 50. And um, there's a really good article on this called um, The Nature of the Firm by Ronald Coase. Uh, back in 1932, he was, was an economist who wrote this article, which found that firms will continue to grow so long as external transaction costs are greater than internal transaction costs. So it's cheaper to get the work done internally, hire employees, do it that way. Mm -hmm. but nowadays with technology, with outsourcing, um, with automation workflows that you can build quite cheaply, it's actually easier to get quality talent to do the work externally and cheaper, which means that you can keep your cost base low, but deliver awesome talent. Um, and as a result of that, charge a client less, but keep your margins higher than someone who's got all these big bloated team internally. So right. we've actually purposely brought our core team size down, but increased that extended team uh, around the world, which is why we've been able to work with companies across different continents, despite the fact that our team size is relatively small. Um, but we've had to be, build a lot of workflows for that, a lot of structure processes, like I've got Google Docs for specific processes that are like 30 pages long with lots of uh, screenshots and speech bubbles and all sorts of stuff, but that's critical. And, and that's why I think a lot of the times when people try and outsource something, they say, oh yeah, I tried outsourcing, it didn't work. And it's because firstly, who did you try and bring on board? What was the quality of that person? But then secondly, what was your onboarding process like? Like, did mm. you just expect them to hit the ground running? If so, that's a very foolish uh, assumption to make. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I mean, I guess the other thing I was going to ask you on, on that topic around building a team, uh, both because you have, I guess, the internal core team, but also this kind of external network um, mm -hmm. of team that, that you've built. What do you look for? Like, are, is there, have you learned is there a specific kind of characteristic? Do you take people through some kind of assessment? How, how do you know that someone is going to be a good player to add to your team? That's a very good question. And uh, I mean, it does depend firstly on the role. Like if I'm bringing on, say, some kind of an inside salesperson, um, I want to know what, they, what their relationship with adversity is like. like mm. how, how have they dealt with rejection in the past? And it doesn't need to be in the sales domain, but in other domains, um, what difficulties have they gone through in life? What do they do on a regular basis that gets them out of their comfort zone? Or do they prefer to just sit in front of the fireplace and watch Netflix every night? Like asking questions like that um, tells you a lot about someone's character. Uh, and I think that that's really, really important. Um, but ultimately it's also about capping the downside. And I think that's one of the beauties of having these instructions, being able to bring people on relatively quickly and then just giving them a shot. Um, Cause then you can, hedge your bets and maybe bring on five inside sales inside people sales. for two months. And then based on the metrics and based on your experience with them during that time, say, okay, well, we're going to keep um, Michael and, and Michelle, the other two, they just weren't performing. I didn't like their attitude. They weren't responsive. They yeah. just talked a big game, but didn't deliver and move on. And the cost of doing that's not really that high, um, but that's probably going to be a 
better indicator than any interview question I can ask because people can game that stuff. 100%. Yeah. No, I think that's really good advice. We've seen the same thing when we've worked with salespeople in the, in the past. It's like trial three people, let them, you know, go through some leads, let them actually do some work, see how they perform and then base, you know, uh, kind of a, a position for either one or two of them. Uh, you'll know very quickly from actually seeing how they, how they do that work. Um, mm -hmm. Steve, you are a, a Harvard business review contributor, right? Or you, you've done some writing for HBR, correct? Correct. Yes. What's, like, so I think that's a place that a lot of consultants want to be there, right? HBR is still very prestigious. Um, how did you create that opportunity? Um, I, again, having a, sh a very healthy relationship with adversity. Um, I think it was very much a case of getting rejected several times by HBR over the period of about three years. Yeah. And, and even with, one of my articles that went viral on HBR, it was called The Case for the Six-Hour Workday. That article I pitched to one of the editors and they basically came back and said, yeah, don't really, not really feeling it. And then I went back to LinkedIn and I sought out the chief of staff there, sent them not only that article, but about nine other pitches. And they said, yeah, I like two or three of these. I'm going to share these with my team and come back to you. Literally a week later, he said, we would love for you to write an article on this or send us a draft and, mm. and we'll have a look at it. And then about three months later, that draft turned into an article and that article actually, you're, you know, you're right. There's a reason why it's prestigious because they still get a hell of a lot of eyeballs on the back of that article going live. It was syndicated by the Wall Street Journal, um, news.com.au here in Australia, the New, Ze New Zealand Herald, like various publications around the world. European CEO was another one. Um, and that for us generated a lot, a lot of inbound leads, a lot of interest and also propelled us to create a new service line, which was all around productivity and, and, and performance, um, and how you go about automating, prioritizing, outsourcing, all that sort of jazz in your organization. Um, but it really is persistence. However, having said that luck is just the intersection of opportunity and preparedness. And up until that point, I had published maybe about 400 blog posts on various platforms, including our own. So I had developed the ability to write somewhat intelligibly. Um, and that obviously helps when you're writing for Harvard Business Review. Uh, and How many times did you say that you actually reached out to HBR before they accepted? Probably seven or eight times. Um, yeah. And it's, it's not too dissimilar from... Uh, the book deal I got with uh, Wiley last mm -hmm. year for my book, Employee to Entrepreneur. Going into that, so I wrote this 10,000 word book proposal. I found email addresses of all the book publishers and agents that I wanted to reach out to. I prioritized that list by the ones that I was least interested in working for and started sending it to them first because then I was getting feedback with all the rejections and I would update my pitch as I went. And it was around the 39th pitch, which was too Wiley that I got an email back saying, hey, we'd love to chat. When are you free to, to grab a coffee or whatever it was? And several conversations later, I had the book deal with them. But again, it's about not giving up after the fifth, 10th, 15th, 20th rejection. How big has that book been for, for your business? I mean, comparing the, the impact of the book versus let's say the HBR article, how, what would you say? Good question. And I think going into it from day one, I never expected the book to be very impactful for my business because it is a, it is a different target segment. Uh, right. It's employee to entrepreneur. It's for people who want to make that leap versus corporate executives who are working for a big Fortune 500 company and they need innovation services. Right. Um, but for me, it was more of a, a passion project. However, having said that, it does provide a massive amount of social proof, um, particularly because I've got Wiley um, on the book cover. I've got Adam Grant endorsing the book on the book cover. So when I actually go out there and speak to prospects, you know, I'll, sometimes I'll take a copy of the book. Hope they don't take it the wrong way. I'm not telling them to quit their jobs. Um, the thing is if you send it out to all of your ideal clients, right, you end up, may end up finding out that they're just leaving the business and yeah. Exactly, exactly. But um, it does it does help with the social proof piece and um, allaying any concerns people might have because one of the big challenges with any boutique, smaller consultancy is you're often compared to Accenture or Deloitte or something like that. And oftentimes that social proof, they've already got that. Like you don't, you got the rubber stamp of Deloitte. You don't need to worry about, hey, we're Deloitte and this is why you should trust us. Um, as a small consultancy, you need to do everything you can there. So capturing case studies, capturing video testimonials, getting into publications like HBR, getting a book deal with a big publisher all go a very long way.
Yeah, definitely. So you advise startups, right? You've, you've written the book you host a podcast, you got the HBR, right? Obviously you lead your, your company as, as CEO. What do you do every day, Steve, to kind of make sure that you're running at high levels of, of performance and focus? Uh, I mean, on a personal level, the ability to do that is based on one automating all rudimentary repeatable process oriented tasks. And the ones that I can't automate, um, I'll outsource or delegate. And that way I free myself up to focus only on the critical thinking piece. Give um, us some examples. Like I just want to make this very tangible for everyone. Yeah. Kind of, what, what are some of those key ones look like that you've automated and then some that you've delegated? Sure. So, I mean, one of the key ones that will resonate with all consultants is um, a proposal automation tool we've developed uh, where previously you're putting together the bones of a proposal. You've got proposals on several different computers, uh, multitude of, of folders and whatnot. We built this tool where we will simply select title page, exec summary, uh, the services we need, some case studies about us, back cover, upload the client logo, upload the client name, and, and it will spit out a skeleton uh, PowerPoint. And then all it is is just customizing uh, some of the key things in there. So you're basically freeing yourself up to focus on the critical thinking rather than spending half an hour just doing the monotonous, repeatable right. algorithmic stuff, right? right? So that's an example yeah. of an automation tool where that saves... Uh, me, maybe, you know, I, I probably put three proposals together a week, maybe four. That saves me about two hours a week. Um, right. Another one would be um, podcast promotion. Uh, so another thing we've built is a content distribution tool where if I publish a podcast, it will automatically go onto YouTube. It will be turned into an audiogram, uh, transcribed. It will be then published onto different social media platforms. And then those... Twitter posts, for example, we've got a tool we use called Ribbon, which will then take snippets from that podcast and turn them into text. So rather than just saying episode 354, it's like, what does discipline have to do with success? Find out in this episode. And that's mm. literally all automated. Again, if I was to do all that stuff myself, it would take hours. Um, so that's yes. one thing. And then just to take that podcast example further on the outsourcing front, uh, looking for guests, reaching out to guests, um, putting together show notes, producing the track, uploading the track, all that stuff is outsourced as well. And I used to do that stuff myself when I started the podcast, you know, and I'm sure you probably did too. Yeah, it takes a lot of time, man. It takes hours and hours. And, and that just frees me up, frees me up. But then outside of that, it's the stuff you do every day, right? So waking up like it's 7.40, it's 8 a.m. right now in Australia, but two hours ago I was in the gym working out, you know, meditating, trying to get my eight hours sleep, uh, doing all that stuff that helps you function at a high level and also helps you regulate your emotions because as a leader, you can't be going into the office feeling like crap all the time because that's going to infect your team and you're going to make really bad decisions as a, as a byproduct of that. Yeah, no, it sounds like we're very aligned in some of those habits and, and beliefs uh, and also delegation of, of podcasts and so forth. So if you look back kind of over the last 12 months, what you know principles or, or ideas would you say that you've really learned and kind of implemented into your business that you feel has had the greatest impact? So something new that's been like just kind of a game changer for you? Yeah, something new that's been a game changer. I think it's that big piece of coming back from a bigger team to a smaller team. Mm. Uh, and for example, right now we're embarking on a big sort of SEO refresh. And my sh philosophy now is very much pay top dollar for strategy, but then bring it back when it comes to the execution. So we will find an SEO guru. We might be quite comfortable paying them five grand for a one week gig, mm. but they're going to come back to us with awesome recommendations about what we need to do next. But then when it comes to implementing those recommendations, I can just find someone to, you know, who's great at algorithmic tasks. They're not going to get five grand a week, but that's better than say hiring an SEO person for like 80 K a year. Who's mediocre going to make average decisions and you're going to spend them, spend a, ton more money so yeah. for my thing nowadays is pay top dollar for experts but pay a lot less for execution great advice uh steve i want to thank you so much for coming on here today uh, it's been great just learning a bit about your story and, and having you share uh, some of those best practices with uh, everyone here i want to make sure that people can learn more about you and your work so what's the uh, best place to uh send them to sure so collectivecampus.io uh, is probably the best place to send them to, but uh, they can find out more about my books, blogs, podcasts, all that sort of stuff at steveglaveski.com. Perfect. We'll have all that linked up in the show notes. Again, Steve, thanks so much for coming on. No worries. Thanks, Michael. It's been an absolute pleasure.